So I'm here to tell you a bunch of stories and uh, I'm going to start in an organic store where I was standing and um, you know how when you bought stuff they ask you for your loyalty number and I kept giving them uh, a mobile number and the store manager kept saying sorry that's the wrong number. I kept repeating it and it just wouldn't come up. At which point he took my name, pulled out his mobile number, phone and said, Madam, this is your number. And I said, yes, you are right. And that's when I realized I was reading out another number. It was my partner's. It's the phone that was connected to our gas connection, to our internet bill, to our loyalty program at the grocery store. It's also a number that I no longer called because my partner's phone is with me after his death. That day, I walked home. There was a chant echoing in my head. My mobile number, his mobile number, my mobile number, his mobile number. I reached home, removed my mask, and I began to empty out my grocery bag. Plumped tomatoes, uh, fresh local cheese, basil leaves, all came out. I needed to make pizza that day. I measured out the flour. I use a mixture of millets and flour. I added water to the yeast. Just a second. I added water to the yeast now. A few minutes later, I picked it up, put it to my ears. It whispered back to me full of life. I kneaded the dough, pummeled it, pulled it towards me, folded it, tore the basil, inhaled the smell of that, made tomato puree, and finally, after many hours, the pizza came out of the oven. It was just right, it was crisp, it was, the cheese was bubbling brown. And I did what we usually did together. I went to the dining table, cut the pizza into four slices, split a ch Kashmiri chili, put the chili flakes on it, and I inhaled the memories. You know, that's when I realized that so much of cooking and food is healing. And it's a therapy that I had not let myself indulge in. Because for the last one year almost, I didn't go into the kitchen that much. It used to be a space where we used to cook together we would make poha for breakfast. We would make curry and chawal and bindi for lunch. Or we'd make, you know, um, dinner together. Uh, I would roll out the puris, he would fry them. So it was that space where we shared together. Ever since his death, I would only go into the kitchen to reheat pre-made food or for a cup of tea or coffee. But now, I was in the middle of a pandemic like all of us, I was all alone in the company of my grief. And so I needed to start cooking. And I realized I was actually cooking for comfort, like so many of us, right? Food does that. It serves up comfort in the form of a beloved dish. Um, I want you to take a second, think what is your soul food? When I was thinking about it, and I realized another one for me is, is really hot Mumdar Kitri with puddles of ghee, methyano uh, atharu, and some chas. And it's what my mother used to make when I was really ill or my sister was sick. And add to it a side of French fries, homemade French fries, tossed in chili, salt. And you know what? That is like a warm hug on a very, very dark day. Food is, for me, what connects us. We send it to friends and families for celebration. We send it to say we care. In my first year of grief, my friends didn't know what to say. They didn't know how to react to my sadness, but they wanted to be there. And this whole chain of food would keep coming into my house, which was basically their way of saying, I don't know what to say right now, 
I don't know how to be there for you, but here's Aru Poshto and Luchi. Here's a batch of chocolate chip cookies I made for you, along with a lot of my love. Food binds memories together, doesn't it? You know, all our senses come together. If you cook, you know this, right? Especially smell and touch. They come together and suddenly they go into your brain and do that little thing where if they sneak out stories from the crevices of your brain and suddenly you remember that one day when something happened and you were sharing that meal. So even that day as I kneaded the dough, I, it had separate ingredients which, you know, don't seem to come together but as I kneaded it, it all came together and for me what it did was it invoked yesterday. You know, in a study, um, I'm going to look at my notes for this because I don't remember the names very easily, Jordan Troisi and Shira Gabriel told us, comfort food fulfills the need to belong. Which makes sense, right? We turn to comfort foods in moments of isolation. Because food is who we are. But the fact is, we are made up of food. But you know, we've been listening to this word, forgotten food. What happens when you lose that ingredient, that method which goes into making your comfort food? Today we are at a time in we're at the age of the Anthropocene, where climate losses are constantly battering at us. One of its biggest impact is on food and agriculture, right? When I was studying food security at my university, a lot of the conversation, typically, we were college students like all of you, was about chocolate and the impact of the climate crisis on that. And the thing is that the Ivory Coast farmers know this. They have said that unpredictable rains will wreak havoc on cacao production. And that's scary because a quarter of the, far of, of the farmers in Ivory Coast are working on cocoa production. Uh, the GDP is something like 15% from cocoa, but climate change, and I'm very, very sorry, but I'm sure you're going to agree with me, we need chocolate to fight the dementors of our lives. And so, no, we need chocolate, we've got to figure out how to keep that comfort food with us. Closer home, Mysore farmers are telling us something similar, that the mango flower blossoms are blossoming much are uh, delayed of blossoming because of the late arrival of rains. Now think about it, no mangoes. These are losses, they're just racking up. We are witnessing them slowly, somewhere, sometimes rapidly. So next story, as I said, I'm going to do a series of stories. Every winter, my mother would put my sister and me in an auto rickshaw and we would go to Ville Parley West Market to buy seasonal vegetables. First would come all the winter vegetables because undu has to be made. The second would be pokta, which is actually called that. The green chana is called that because when you pop open the peel, it makes that sound. And that's why it's called pokta, or at least that's what I thought as a child. And so we bought fistfuls of them for afternoon sake. And the other was something called pok. I had no idea what pork was. It was just something very delicious. I absolutely love pork, which you had with lemon and pepper save. I went back many years later, and I couldn't find a single place in the market that, could, that sold the pork. I looked and looked, and finally one store had it, and I bought almost all his supply, because it, I was craving my childhood feeling, where I wanted just a taste of that fresh jawar in my mouth with the crunch of the lemon pepper save. And that's what the, makes the turn of season special, right? Looking forward to the different food traditions of each culture. Think about it, summer, Aam Panna and Bail Sharbat. Monsoon, uh, we welcome the first rains with a butta, which is roasted on coals, slathered with butter and fr lime and salt and uh, chili and bite into it and that's when we Welcome the monsoon, or like I said, winter, undu and fresh puri puffed up. But now the fact is that a lot of these ingredients, 
Now, there two, there's a duality of this which I find really interesting, is that either these foods are available all the times, which one doesn't make it special, but the second, as Mina pointed out, what it really does is it means that lots more carbon miles for them to travel long distances, a lot more of, um, of, of emissions because you're storing them for a longer time, and let's face it, then they taste like cardboard most of the time. You, the fact is that it's sun-kissed mangoes that we all crave for. So one is that either they're available all the time, not making them special, plus making them taste like cardboard, and the second is that they're never, ever available. Demand nay, hey, madam. That's what I've told. So next one, next story. Before popcorn made it into our home, we were never allowed to have popcorn, uh, we, only at school fairs, not even in cinemas. We used to have something called dhani, which was popped jawar, which was earthier, smaller, and much more nuttier in taste. And that is forgotten food. It's, it's millet. They are non-thirsty. They are native. They grow in um, drought-like conditions. And they're downright delicious. I remember meeting this farmer, this organic and fair trade farmer in, uh, in Telangana who told me, we eat all the food of our ancestors, millets. You city people, you eat rice, we don't eat that. We have jawar and maki. And when he said that, it made me think that we're seeing a huge loss, which is of our health, our history, and also, as we heard before, of economics. So, what I think is what we need to do is scratch the surface of our white rice and wheat diet and suddenly you'll see this cornucopia, this abundance of native island foods that we can have. And they're really delicious. And the good thing is, we know, demand is hai, right? Meals are being cooked by restaurant chefs using minutes as the base. Uh, reels on Instagram and Facebook are constantly telling you how to make something with foxtail millet and you know you'll go to stores where you'll find fancy mini packets of this. This is happening while all the elders at home, the cooperatives and the farmers are shaking their head and saying but we know this. Why is this a big deal? But apparently it is. Um, in 2016 I got obsessed with a chili. Um, it's called the Aleppo chili and it rates some, ranges somewhere on 10,000 in the Scoville uh, test which is, tells you how hot a pepper is. The thing about this chili was that it was getting endangered and I couldn't understand how does a chili get endangered. I read up and read up and realized that it was a combination of failed crop harvests, climate change and the civil war in Syria. And that was driving an entire chili to no longer exist. Take a moment and think what that means. To not be able to use that one spice that gives that certain flavor to your foods. The same thing is happening with the Shiracha sauce chili. It's an jalapeno that's grown somewhere in South USA and North Mexico. But because of unseasonal rains, and the fact that it has to grow at a certain temperature, has to be harvested at a certain time, it's getting impacted. And Sri Raja sauce is not going to be Sri Raja sauce without, without it. There are going to be many upset hipsters out there, I can tell you that. So I started re reading up on chilies and I realized that chilies have their own geotags because they're really identified by the regions they're grown in, like our own Bhut Jolakya chili, the ghost chilies of the Northeast. And um, it made me think that what's happening is a little scary about our foods. But then, what happened with my grief and what is happening with this collective grief that we are facing with our food losses is that we rally together. We find hope in all of this. And when you see closely, you realize that's what's happening. People, um, as the refugee crisis worsens along with the climate change one, people are traveling f uh, to, are, find, are making new homes as they lose new ones. And there are people who welcome them. There are kitchens that are opened up for them to be able to cook their own food, to be able to share new foods, and basically understand grief 
of leaving their homeland. So yes, I think that's perhaps or and then there's the in Swal there's a doomsday vault where all the seeds are kept and stored for a future crisis. And because of the Syrian uh, civil war, recently a withdrawal was made. And that's how the scientists are going to be able to replicate some of the foods that have been lost over there. So which means we are finding ways of coping, we're finding ways of healing. And these are becoming part of our stories. Now talking of stories, uh, as you all heard, I'm a writer, I edit books. And um, one of my books is this one, it's called What's Name I Eating Today? And it's about a girl who's like us, she's constantly eating and eating and eating, but like uh, Neema likes to eat with the seasons. Now, I often go to classrooms and I show this one image to children. And I'm like, uh, tell me, what is she eating? So there's a lot of exciting excitement. There's pineapple, uh, the earlier pages have mangoes, then there's bananas, and then corn. And then when they see this, almost nine out of 10 times, every child tells me, blueberry. That's not a blueberry. That's a jamon, yes. And when I tell them it's a jamon, so many children don't know that. And jamon is something that grows very abundantly in different parts of India. And I'm talking uh, about sta uh, states where this is grown, where I've gone and talked to children. Bombay, Bangalore, Jaipur. And that's a blueberry. So we're losing. We're not. We're failing in passing down the knowledge of our of our foods, while they know very well of a food that's travelled thousands of miles and is horrendously expensive. But they seem to know about that. So, not only are we losing the knowledge, but according to me, what we are losing is the connection with this food, and that to me is a reason to grieve. A grieving for the losses brought up by our own action, our own forgetfulness, and climate change. But you know what? As I said, we can, we are changing that. We are reviving foods. You, uh, we just heard how we are reviving forgotten foods right here in Gujarat, and that's one example that's being magnified by amazing cooperatives, by amazing farmers, amazing entrepreneurs, right? And. Doing that, we bring back those memories, even if they go back generations. In fact, you know, in one of my books, uh, I, a lot of people keep asking me, why do you write so much about food? Because, and I'm like, why wouldn't I write so much about food? Because food is so much a part of us. In one of my books, Savi and the Memory Keeper, the dining table becomes the space of isolation because everyone gathers there um, and they're grieving the loss of their father, so the mother, the, uh, the sister, and the protagonist, Savi, and they don't know what to talk to each other. As time passes, one day they gather at the dining table for a post-school snack, and of course there is dokla, because there has to be dokla after school, and there's coriander chutney and desum chutney, and as they start eating, suddenly they start talking. They talk about their father's memories, how the father and the mother met. They talk, they have a whole panathon, which used to be a family tradition of theirs. And they laugh, they cry, and the food is polished off, and the memories is what lingers. And that's what I do. I find a way to use cooking and creating, recreating some of my comfort foods to heal. That day, I made pizza. The next day, a few days later, a friend came over. I made her millet poha, which was our breakfast tradition. I tossed our favorite uh, pasta with, uh, with local spinach and a locally made cheese. I, uh, on his birthday, I slow cooked some gawar. It was all caramelly with a hint of ajwain. I sat alone and I ate it by myself, but with a side of memories. Thank you.